Thanks, Adrian. You just said what I was going to say, so that was the style of that. Thank you. Um, have we started there? So I have my disclaimer. Lots and lots of words to read there. You can read that if you want to at some later stage. So when we started to consider what to speak about today, we looked at why use renewable energy in mining. And some people have already talked about various aspects of why you would. It is an excellent alternative to diesel power, um, the operating cost security, so making sure that you're not dependent on um, rising fuel costs, um, and the transportation, of course, of diesel, which is a cost as well that needs to be incorporated into. Reducing your carbon footprint, and mining is often considered to be a dirty sort of industry, so that it helps with the image of mining. Um, minimising the need to spend money on things like the gas infrastructure. Um, storage, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. I've talked to a lot of people who are on mine sites and say that the noise of the generators near where they're trying to sleep is a big impact on them, and that's a, an area that we can certainly help with. Um, and again, as Jürgen said about the um, solar irradiation, we're in a fantastic place for that. So, AVL. We are an Australian vanadium mining company. We're actually in exploration at the moment. We've got a deposit just south of Mikathara, Gabonintha. It's a significant project, and it's a, a long-life mine. So that's where, from a renewable energy perspective, that really helps us, the fact that we have got a long mine life planned. The nearest gas pipelines are at Mount Magnet and Waluna. So we're looking at trying to in incorporate the um, renewable energy into the mine site. So, why? Again, cost reduction, security of price, reduction in CO2 emissions, long life project, and an opportunity to reduce the project operating costs. Because we'd had a study done of what the energy would be used at the mine, and they said it was going to be around about $20 million a year. So if you're looking at a long mine life, that's a lot of money. What are we considering? Solar PV. That seems to be a standard. Why wouldn't you? Concentrated solar power. Vanadium flow batteries, of course. And how are we going to do that? There's various different financial mechanisms. We have a company who are happy to lease the batteries because they see that this particular battery has um, a value at the end of life. They're a 20-year lifespan. They have a 30% value at the end of their life with the electrolyte that's in the batteries. So they're offering leases now to replace the battery after five years if you want to, with because people are worried about the latest, greatest battery coming along and, oh no, I've committed to a 20-year battery when this one's even better. But if you lease the product, then you can then replace it with that new version. Financing where you spread the payments out and then, as people have mentioned already today, where somebody else develops and funds the project and you just purchase the energy from them. Now, to look at energy in our mind, what I just look, decided to do is to look at where we use energy. Where are the really high energy usage points? And those of you in mining, well, this is just your bread and butter, I'm sure. But in our particular mine, we have machinery for crushing and grinding. So there's a massive amount of power to start that up and then 410 kilow kilowatts an hour to keep it going. So what could you use, what sort of power could you use for that? We're looking at concentrated solar power for that, for the electrical or the solar power plant. So putting in the solar, adding in diesel and batteries to assist with peaking power and startup. So combination of things. I talk about vanadium flow batteries a lot, but it doesn't mean that we're averse to using lithium because lithium is a good option for if you need that peak, if you need that sharp amount of power, that's the sort of place that you'd be using that. Roasting, and this is where the concentrated solar comes in. We need to get the ore to a high, high temperature, around 1,000 degrees C for two hours. So that's a really energy-intensive process. And in the concentrated solar process, there's a part where steam is generated, which generates the heat, which can bring us up to a certain point, and then we can use some gas to top that up, or diesel, or something else, to top that up to get to the temperature that we need to. And I'm going to show a little video in a minute, and it will show how you generate electricity using concentrated solar. But there's a 
a point in that particular process where you create the steam and that's where you can grab the heat out by modifying the process to grab the heat to use for this. Heating is required elsewhere in our processing. We've got the desilication, AMV precipitation. AMV is ammonium metavanidate. Don't ask me what that is, but that's what it is. So you can also use your con um, concentrated solar. That is an energy storage in itself. So you can use the heat and you can use the electricity as well. Base load, so just the general energy requirements of the mine site the solar PV, the CSP, gas hybrid, diesel. We're sort of open to all the different options there. The storage can help step between the fossil fuel and the renewable for the intermittency. So again, that's going back to your lithium batteries. And then long duration storage to capture any spilled solar or CSP. So if you're creating this electricity, you might as well store it. Yes, the concentrated solar has got a storage in it, but the solar doesn't, so you can capture that. The key place that I see the vanadium flow battery being useful in a mine site is for the camp. You've got people there who go out to work all day. The solar, the sun's shining all day long. You can capture it and use it at the end and at the beginning and all night if you've sized everything properly. Now, that was my process flow chart, which I was going to point out, but that's where all our power is used during it. I'm not an expert about sol concentrated solar by any stretch, so I got in touch with Solar Reserve, and Daniel, I think, is in the room at the moment, and they very kindly let me play my video so that it can explain for you. So if you could play the video, please. Solar Reserve's technology, typically referred to as concentrated solar power, uses thousands of mirrors to reflect and concentrate sunlight onto a central point to generate heat, which in turn is used to generate electricity. More than 10,000 tracking mirrors called heliostats reside in a four square mile field where they reflect and concentrate sunlight onto a large heat exchanger called a receiver that sits atop a 550 foot tower. Within the receiver, fluid flows through the piping that forms the external walls. This fluid absorbs the heat from the concentrated sunlight. In Solar Reserve's technology, the fluid utilized is molten salt, which is heated from 500 to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Molten salt is an ideal heat capture medium because it maintains a wider operating temperature range in liquid state, allowing the system to operate at low pressure for superior and safe energy capture and storage. After passing through the receiver, the molten salt then flows down the piping inside the tower and into a thermal storage tank where the energy is stored as high temperature molten salt until electricity is needed. Solar Reserve's technology leverages liquid molten salt as both the energy collection and the storage mechanism, which allows it to separate energy collection from electricity generation. When electricity is required by the utility, day or night, the high temperature molten salt flows into the steam generator as water is piped in from the water storage tank to generate steam. Once the hot salt is used to create steam, the cooled molten salt is then piped back into the cold salt storage tank, where it will then flow back up the receiver to be reheated as the process continues. After the steam is used to drive the steam turbine, it is condensed back to water and returned to the water holding tank, where it will flow back into the steam generator when needed. The result is high quality superheated steam to drive a standard steam turbine at maximum efficiency to generate reliable non-intermittent electricity during peak demand hours. The steam generation process is identical to the process used in conventional gas, coal, or nuclear power plants, except that it is 100% renewable with zero harmful emissions or waste. Solar reserve plants provide on-demand, reliable electricity from a renewable source, the sun even after dark. So I don't know if you noticed there, but when you got to the bit with the steam, that's where we've been modifying the system to be able to generate the heat from it. And I think it said 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 540 degrees centigrade. So energy storage options. Vanadi Australian vanadium, as I said, has a deposit just south of Mikathera. We're also looking at creating um, vanadium electrolyte, which is the fuel used in the batteries. 
We have a pilot plant at the University of Western Australia where we've managed to create battery-grade electrolyte. And the idea eventually is to have a mine site where we mine the vanadium. We have a mine-attached facility to create the electrolyte, which then goes into the batteries. And then we sell the batteries and we can put the electrolyte from our mine into the batteries, but we can also supply to worldwide manufacturers. There's a battery being created in, by Ronki in China at the moment, which is 200 megawatt, 800 megawatt hours, and that's a lot of vanadium. So that's where we're aiming. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit about vanadium flow batteries. The difference between vanadium and lithium. Lithium is a very much a power source. It's when you need power. You need a lot of power. We've talked before about how if you've got a solar PV array and then you've got a diesel genset and you want to be able to, when the solar goes down, have power to hold you up until your genset comes online. That's where the lithium battery fits in beautifully. Vanadium flow batteries are long energy. They're energy storage devices. They have lots of hours of energy and they can have a four, it's a four hour plus system. I like to think of it in the way of the electric vehicles. So if you think of an electric vehicle, the battery in the car is your lithium battery and it's a portable device and it can hold that power that you need. The vanadium flow battery is your, what charges that. That's your big vat of energy that can sit there and charge the battery in the car and that's the sort of difference between the two. So the key comparisons, energy battery, power battery. Energy stored in electrolyte tanks, whereas in lithium battery, they're stored in the cell. So in a vanadium flow battery, your state of charge is measured by one liquid. It's just the state of charge of the liquid. Whereas with the lithium battery, you have multiple cells that you have to look at. It's stable. This is what I always rant and rave about. We live in a bushfire country. This is a non-flammable device, so it's really useful in that sort of way. Long lifespan, 20 years plus, due to very high cycle. There's no degradation in performance over 20 years. So what you get at the beginning, you don't have to oversize it. You get what you want, and that's what you get at the end of 20 years. The electrolyte can be reused. I don't understand all the financials of this, but some people are saying that they could use the electrolyte as a commodity to trade on. So the vanadium electrolyte would sit in the battery, and then people would trade with that. So anyway, that's just another world for me. <laughs> Scalability, so you just put lots and lots and lots of batteries together. They're plug and play, so if you want four megawatts, for example, you have the four of the one megawatt batteries together. 100% depth of discharge, like I said. So this is another little video, and this explains how the vanadium flow battery works. The vanadium redox battery, or VRB for short, is a type of flow battery. There are two tanks of solution, one positive, one negative, with one or more cell stacks between them. The cell stack functions like the engine of the battery. A positive electrolyte solution is pumped from a tank on one side of the battery through the cell stack, while a negative electrolyte solution is pumped from a tank on the other side of the battery. A thin membrane in the cell stack keeps the two solutions from mixing together. When the battery is being charged, the vanadium 4 plus ions in the uncharged positive electrolyte give up an electron. The electrons travel up the current collector and out from the positive half of the cell stack. They then enter the current collector of the negative half of the cell stack and jump onto the vanadium 3 plus ions in the uncharged negative electrolyte, converting it into a vanadium 2 plus solution. The addition or subtraction of electrons causes the solutions to change color. When the battery is discharged, the opposite process takes place. The electrolyte solution in the VRB is inert to charge-discharge cycling. Its cycle life is, theoretically, limitless, and energy can be stored for an indefinite period of time. So, in summary, we're going to consider all different renewable um, alternatives as part of our process design. These are the two that we're particularly keen on. We'll, initially, we'll probably just start up with the solar 
and the battery. And I guess that's something that we had a dinner last night and one of the things that came out of it was to just get started, to just have something small. Don't think that you have to go for the whole 20 megawatts or however many mega, mega, megawatts you need. Start with something that's manageable and then you can learn from that rather than trying to do it all in one go. And if it's a long, a long life mining project, it makes even more sense, as we said. That's all I've got. Thank you.